Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Institutional Investor Panel. Uh, my name is Tom Fink. I am a Chairman and CEO of Babson Capital Management. And I'm very honored today to be able to moderate this panel. Uh, the subject of our panel is where in the world will returns come from? And clearly in an environment uh, where we have uh, very low rates due to uh, central bank accommodations. Uh, we continue to have uh, political and social events that create volatility. Uh, investing is maybe as difficult as it's ever been for institutional investors. But today we have a great panel uh, of some of the leading institutional investors to help take us through what they're thinking and what they're seeing and dealing with uh, the global markets and where there may be opportunity uh, uh, in 2013 and, and beyond. Uh, a brief introduction starting to my far right is Joe Deere, the Chief Investment Officer of California's Public Employees Retirement System. Uh, Joe oversees uh, one of the largest uh, public pension funds with $256 billion under management and is responsible for all its investment and operating activity. Uh, next to Joe, uh, from my home state, is the treasurer of North Carolina, Janet Cow. Uh, Janet is uh, just begun her second term uh, as the treasurer of North Carolina and oversees $80 billion in pension fund investments for the 875,000 teachers, firefighters, and state employees. Uh, in addition to her responsibilities as treasurer, she has oversight for the state's banking system, and more recently taken on the state health plan. Uh, representing our colleagues uh, internationally, to my left is Michael Sabia. He is the president and chief executive officer of Case de Depot in Canada. Case De Depot manages institutional funds primarily from public and private pension and insurance funds in Quebec. Uh, with over $176 billion in assets under management, Case is one of the largest managers uh, in North America and invests on a global basis. And finally, uh, my friend from uh, Brazil, Maurizio Wanderly, is the chief investment officer of Dalia one of the largest Brazilian pension funds um, with over $8 billion under management. And uh, Valia is focused primarily on domestic investments and has an extensive portfolio of fixed income and equity investments uh, in Brazil and, and Latin America. So with that introduction, where I thought I'd start is really, uh, we have some leading institutional investors here and just maybe just start with uh, your overview of how you're approaching uh, your investment strategies, uh, you know, maybe as the nature of your funds drives you to uh, develop certain type of allocation strategies and um, you know, where you're going in the current environment. And Joe, right. why don't we start with right. you? Right, thanks Tom, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my first public appearance as Chief Investment Officer for CalPERS was here at the Milken Global Conference four years ago. And I had my talking points and I was confident and we were gonna turn CalPERS around and things were all gonna get better. At the time we were on our way to losing 24% of our portfolio in that year. We, we dropped a hundred billion dollars from peak to trough. Uh, I thought I would find some good professional challenges coming to California and I have to say I really succeeded beyond my wildest expectations when I I did that. But here we are today. Uh, we actually have our assets back up to 260 billion, so we have uh, resumed uh, our pre crisis peak. Now, our liabilities didn't go away while this happened, so it's, it's good news, but it's, you know, the funded status went from 60 to 73, so it's headed the right direction. But there's a lot of work left to go. Well, how did we get this recovery? basically by sticking to what we were doing, which was a portfolio with a lot of growth risk, high exposure to equity, and we maintained that, and then a lot of restructuring work, applying the lessons of the global financial crisis, and I know, Tom, you're gonna to wanna to talk about that on the, yeah. uh, on the panel today, and then we did a lot of work with team, we made some tough decisions about partners who we were working with, uh, and we wanna understand, in a much more profound way, risk uh, in a public pension fund portfolio. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Janet? All right. So uh, also glad to be back. This is my third time <laughs> at Milken. And uh, we have now, uh, like Joe Deere, rebounded from my first term as treasurer, which was in 2009, where we lost $20 billion. Um, and we're now back over $80 billion. We have slowly been increasing our alternative assets over that time. And I should say that I'm a sole fiduciary. Um, and that is checked and balanced by the General Assembly of North Carolina. Um, and we have to get permission from them to uh, allocate funds. I know this is not a best practice. Um, but I was a state senator, so that helps. <laughs> and uh, so we have always had a very conservative portfolio allocation. That certainly has helped us with the market volatility in stocks. But we have 35% in fixed income and uh, about 40 plus percent in equities. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing right now, uh, we know we have to move money out of that in order to, to sort of meet our seven and a quarter percent actual return. We have a bill in the General Assembly, uh, which is going to be heard Thursday, uh, which would give us a 40 percent allocation to alternative assets. We have 20 percent now uh, in alternatives. Uh, we have the capability to do more than that, but 20 percent actual committed. Um, that would, I think, put us more at the forefront of public pensions in our flexibility and would certainly give us a lot of options as we look to uh, where do we want to invest, where are the opportunities as we move out of fixed income. So wish me luck <laughs> with the General <laughs> Assembly. But I, I actually feel uh, cautiously optimistic about it. So I wish you luck. Yeah. <laughs> um, moving over here, uh, Maritza, why don't we... Uh, you know, start with you and, and tell us a little bit about, you know, how you're approaching well, your business. Uh, Valia is a bit different from the, the other funds here. Uh, I, I would say that we are a little bit overweighted in Brazil, approximately <laughs> 100%. And, uh, but we're starting now looking at uh, the overseas diversification. That's, uh, I think, a matter of time. Uh, but there is a reason. Uh, if you look at the Brazilian history, we, we used to have a high level of interest rates, and so it was, a, I would say that's the paradise for pension funds. That's, to give an idea, we have 60% allocated in fixed income, uh, where 92% of that is inflation-linked bonds. And so it's very easy to implement liability-driven strategies in Brazil. We have a, today more than our, our liabilities cover with more than 100% with inflation linking assets. Uh, but, but of course, uh, it's, uh, we decided to diversify the portfolio because we had a scenario of a reduction of interest rates. And uh, today, we have a 25% in, in equity, 8% committed in private equity, uh, and 8% uh, in real estate. That's the legal limit uh, uh, for Brazil. And uh, that's uh, that portfolio in the last 10 years. We had a good performance around, we had an average 20% per year in the last 10 years that, that make, made our GB plan has a funder ratio around 200% uh, if we consider <laughs> the surplus distribution that uh, we, are, we started doing four years ago where we increased the, the benefit around 75% the base benefits in 75%. So it was good, that's the, uh, uh, but now the situation is different, the interest rate is uh, reduced a lot, uh, uh, start to make sense to look at uh, international markets, uh, and that's what we use to diversify our portfolio from now on. Great, and Michael, coming from Canada, the? Well, like um, pretty much everybody, uh, we've had recovery work to do following the events of 2007 and 2008, and Happy to report that that's all gone reasonably well. So I'll just talk maybe a little bit about how we're thinking about the future. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that the, usually funds like ours and in the industry generally, we talk a lot about asset allocation and how exposed we are in fixed income or equities or whatever. Um, and, and I clearly recognize how important that is. And it's a very important driver of performance. Um, so I'm not suggesting that that perspective is not an important one. But what we're trying to do is we're less persuaded in the current um, environment of, I would say, long-term uncertainty and turbulence that taking decisions to invest in markets or asset classes is necessarily the right question to ask. 
Now, it's an important question. Um, so maybe I should say it's not the only question to ask. We think another very important question, um, probably equally important, and I, is the nature of the assets themselves. Because we're not convinced that just investing in markets or asset classes is necessarily the right guide, what we're trying to do is to be and to put an emphasis on the word selectivity and to focus on particular types of assets, assets of high quality, assets that can deliver performance over the longer term, assets that are rooted in the real economy, uh, the people, goods and services that people use every day, and we're less concerned about whether that falls into a fixed income category, into an equities category, or into this other gray thing called alternatives. Um, we're more focused on what are the nature of these assets and what are the financial characteristics of each one. Um, now that, is a, that sounds moderately okay if you say it fast. Um, that has a lot of implications for how we run the place and, and how we make investment decisions. Uh, maybe we can talk about that, but that's no, where we're No, we should come back to that. And I do, you know, there's some very good points that came up in, in everything that was just said here. Um, and I do want to come back to that because I, I think that's true. I think a lot of what's going on here is the nature of, of how we invest and the type of assets is evolving. But let me go back to, you know, uh, Joe touched on this briefly, and I, I think it's, you know, the obvious question in the room is given the current environments where we've seen uh, yields continue to grind tighter, uh, you know, we're seeing record low yields in U.S. high yield, for instance. Um, Joe, I mean, how do you earn 7.5% in that environment? So you're not going to try to get the whole thing in one year, right? Our target rate of return is 7.5%. They're critics of defined benefit pension plans to think that number's uh, unrealistically high. I think that's partly a result of the pessimism that descended on the world after the global financial crisis. If you actually look at our recent returns, they're pretty good. The one year through March 31 was 10.9. Uh, uh, the three year number's 9.1. That's post the crisis. The five-year number shows the crisis, 2.8%. But when you get to a 10-year view, uh, 8.1, and then since 1987, which is sort of our, the condition of our portfolio, our sort of since inception date, uh, 8.6. Now, there were some really favorable trends, declining interest rates during that. But that 10-year number at over eight through the global financial crisis says that it's attainable. But here's the thing. If we could have slide uh, 12, please. Yeah. Uh, in order to have that kind of return, you have to have a lot of growth risk in the portfolio. And we think of that as equity, but there are other pieces of the portfolio that comprise growth kind of risk. And for our portfolio, it's really like 90, 90, over 90% 90 of the risk in the portfolio. So here's the, the danger, which is a large drawdown. If you're not fully funded and you take a big hit, which is the drawdown is a fancy word for that, there's a possibility of falling into a hole that's so deep that you can't grow your way out of it. And this chart tries to illustrate that. So you see the line between 2012 and 2042, the typical 30-year uh, horizon for a pension fund, and what 7.5%, this says 7.4 there, it's a technical issue there. But what happens if that range of probabilities, the normal curve that you see tilted sideways there, and you hit that really unfortunate outlier event, <laughs> what we had in 2008 and 9? then your growth rate has to be well above the seven and a half. So the challenge for portfolio management is if you want to accept that much growth risk, what are you going to do to prevent that large drawdown? And the easy way of solving that is just reduce the expected rate of return. But that has tremendous consequences on the contribution rate of employers and employees. So there's a reluctance to go that way. It, it's easy, but maybe not the, the best way. And this is something our board is looking at this year, and we'll make a decision at the end of the year. But your other options are uh, tail hedging uh, programs, looking at minimum volatility, low volatility strategy, fundamental indexes. Uh, in our hedge fund program, we're looking at a low beta exposure to, designed to diversify uh, the risk away from growth assets. So I think there are things you can do that, that moderate that chance. Right. And then you have to think hard about what's going to happen when interest rates snap up. Tom, I mean, they're gonna, it's, it's going to happen or there's going to be a currency problem. Uh, it doesn't look like it's in the very near term, but that's something we have to manage as well. But it's, for us, it's, it's achieving that target while being mindful of what could happen if we have another big 
uh, financial crisis. Well, Janet, picking up on, um, on what Joe said, and you had mentioned you, know, you guys had come down $20 billion mm -hmm. in the crisis. Um, and, and based on what you just said is you, know, you have some different options here. And, and a lot of it is, are you doing things uh, to manage that risk, whether it's macro hedging or when you don't have the option necessarily of not taking risk and you have to be long? Are there things you, that you're doing in your portfolios that are adjusting that or addressing that issue? Well, and I'll say we've done the same sort of risk scenarios because after 08, everybody does these. Right. And it's really the, it's not the one-time drawdown. Right. Um, that's the biggest problem. It's the 10 years of slow growth, which I think every pension is going to be a fairly growth-oriented right. uh, uh, portfolio construction. So can you hedge that out? No. I mean, not really. Uh, it's too expensive to hedge out. Not, at a, not at a cost yeah. you want to pay. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, we, we have, when the European markets were super volatile, we did a trading stat, uh, strategy with Galliard where we would get paid to rebalance the portfolio that we were gonna to have to do anyway, right. uh, and, and still uh, make money on that. that. That was a successful strategy for us. Um, certainly on currency, we don't hedge broadly, but uh, you know, we try to look at if something's in euro denominated versus dollar or pound, you, know, you have to have more conviction around it. So there are certain strategies, and uh, we have capabilities to hedge uh, on very small subsegments of the portfolio, but in essence, we're just at risk if there is a low growth environment. Uh, so. well, yeah, Michael, similarly, you, you, know, you came in four years ago, I believe, uh, into a situation, and like all of us, we had parts of our portfolio that you know, had issues through the crisis. Were there things as a CEO of a large asset manager you were looking at either from a portfolio risk or operational basis to, to change the way and make, make sure that didn't happen again in the next event? Uh, yeah, it's um, kind of appallingly simple to, uh, to say. But I had a, um, I should say so that you know where I come from, because what I'm about to say is maybe a little heretical, but um, I haven't spent 20 years in the asset management business. I used to be in the railroad business, and then I ran a telecom company. Um, so you should take this with a few grains of salt. Um, so I'm relatively new to this, to this business. But yeah, when, you know, when I, I came into La Caisse, uh, the situation wasn't good, and I had a pretty simple rule. Yeah. And my simple rule was, um, look, I want to understand what we're investing in. And I might not be the smartest guy in the room, but if I can't understand it, then we're not going to do it. Um, that led to a certain amount of change in our portfolio, which is probably a function of my IQ, but, <laughs> but it did lead to a lot of simplification. Yeah. Uh, we were, I would say, heavily advanced in the alphabet soup theory of investing, where every possible alphabetic acronym we had in the portfolio, and as you know, most of them went boom um, in 2008. So we've had a very simple rule, which is if we don't understand it uh, thoroughly, we don't do it. Um, we have, uh, by and large, stayed away from financial engineering. Uh, we are, as I say, have put a lot of emphasis on we just invest in very high quality assets. We're very careful about when and how we get in. We're very careful about the partners we work with. But that's the focus. The focus is, is this a world-class asset? And if it is a world-class asset and we have the opportunity to invest in it at a reasonable price, then we will do it. Yeah. We will not do things like, and if we add three points of leverage, then we'll get a rate of return that we like. If we need three points of leverage to do it, uh, often that's an early indicator that it's probably not the kind of quality asset that you think it is. So we've been very careful about that, which is not to say that we don't use leverage. We do. We have a big real estate portfolio, about $33 billion gross. Uh, and we do use leverage in that portfolio for pretty obvious financial reasons. But other than that, we're pretty careful. What's your target rate of return? Pardon me? What's your target rate of return? Well, if we, we manage money on behalf of 29 different, uh -huh. different depositors. So I'm going to give you an arithmetic average. And the only thing that's good about it is that it's meaningless because it's just an average of what each one of our, what each one of our clients needs, but it's 6.7%. Uh -huh. So when I hear your numbers, <laughs> I think I have a tough job. My heart goes out to you. <laughs> If it starts with a seven, it's worse than with a six. Um, you want to swap, you know? Uh, 
So that's what we've been, that's what we've been doing. Um, a lot of, you know, it doesn't sound really sophisticated. Uh, it's been hard to do, but it doesn't sound sophisticated. It's just we invest in really high quality assets. Yeah. Um, and we're changing. Just one last point. Uh, you know, what we're starting to do now, uh, which again, I think is slightly heretical, but um, we're more and more interested in absolute returns and not relative returns. Absolute performance, not relative performance. We're less and less, return we're less, and less interested in taking an index as a point, of, a point of departure. We're not very interested in buying the Toronto Stock Exchange or the S&P 500 and then convincing ourselves that we're active managers by underweighting this and overweighting that. We think that's pretty much nonsense. Um, we're going to invest in companies that we like. I mean, there's six banks in Canada. Today in our Canadian equities portfolio, I'll shut up and then, um, <laughs> six banks in, the, our, in big banks in, uh, in, in Canada today, you know, if you're following a relative thing, you underweight three, you overweight three. I don't know that that's that good. If you don't like the three you're underweighting, why own them? The only reason you own them is because you want to hug an index. Makes no sense to me. So we're moving away from that step by step. That's a journey uh, to do that but much more focus on absolute returns, because if you focus on absolute returns, then that opens the window to be selective about the assets that you invest in. Right. Uh, and that's pretty much what, what we're trying to get done. It's a, it's a good point. I mean, and, and maybe Joe or Janet, do you see more moving away from the judging by the benchmark and just say, give me the return and, you know, yeah. Are you still, I mean, how do you respond to that? Well, I, I think from an from a objective of, of the program, yes. And, and I think it's both the asset return, but it's also the liability return. What's the condition of your surplus? Is it improving or not? And we're trying to do a much better job of integrating that view. And that's one of the major projects we have with our board. I'm fortunate to work with a tremendously talented actuary who's, who's part of the organization. And, and, and bring an integrated view and a decision framework that looks not just at what's the asset return, but what's the contribution rate level, what's the contribution rate volatility, and what do we expect the condition of the surplus to be. But, but, but Michael said something I want to underscore, which is moving beyond just the, the simple-minded look at this is equity, this is fixed income, this is real estate. Uh, and if you sort of, the way we talk about it is if you, if you think about your asset menu, you know, you, you've got, uh, you know, clam chowder, uh, and, and, and minestrone soup, right? They're, well, they're both soups, but they're really different, you think. But then, what's the protein content? What's the fat content? What's the, uh, the salt content? So if you look at assets, what are the risk factors? What are the risk characteristics of those assets? And then you see through the, the, the portfolio, the, the label, to what, what the risk really is in the portfolio. And then you can do a lot of things about hedging those risks or taking them out or dialing them up as, as you see them. And, it's a very much a journey. We're not finished with that. We took a step in that direction in 2010 with our uh, asset allocation, and we hope to make a lot of progress this year so that we'll really uh, think about risk in the portfolio and risk in surplus space, uh, and think that will give us a better set of, of terms under which to make decisions. Let me, um, let me move on maybe from, you know, we talked a lot about risk management, and, and start putting a lens on, to your point, yeah, you want to understand the assets, uh, and there's a lot of different asset classes we can talk about out there. And, and maybe if we do it, taking a little bit of a trip around the world. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start in the asset class that a lot of people think is is really where you want to be increasingly in the next few years, and, and that's the emerging markets. And you know, given your you know expertise and position uh, okay. of your value in Brazil. Um, Give us a sense of where you think the emerging markets are and where the opportunities, whether in you know, the local debt or, or equities, may be in the next uh, couple of years, Maurizio. Uh, well, uh, in this diversification process that we start, we see value in equity, public companies. We, uh, I mentioned here before that the Brazilian stock market is different from the Ibovespa. We have much more. Uh, Ibovespa is very concentrated in commodities and the rest of the economy uh, is outside uh, the, 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 the Ibovespa because commodities are 13 percent of Brazilian GDP. And uh, uh, so natural that in this getting out to fixed income, the first movement is to, to equity. Uh, but you use alternatives, mainly private equity, as a complementary uh, approach to equity. 
as I can't invest in some sectors uh, uh, in Brazil that uh, I can't find listed companies. So we are very uh, 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 bullish about the, the private equity uh, uh, in Brazil. We have 8% committed in private equity, 4% invested. Uh, so, for example, that uh, we can access the rising middle class uh, uh, thesis uh, through private equity because it's very difficult to find the consumption uh, companies uh, in, in the market. So that's a way to uh, to act. Uh, real estate also is very interesting in, in, in Brazil. We increase our, our allocation. We have a direct investment in commercial buildings and uh, malls. We have uh, invested uh, through listed companies in malls. Uh, so uh, uh, and some specific points uh, uh, of Brazilian economy, like infrastructure. We have a lack of infrastructure. Um, maybe some people here experienced some, uh, uh, some, had some experiences of Brazilian infrastructure in some moment. If you travel to Brazil, you can see. Uh, and, but it's an opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity to have investment in ports, in uh, oil and gas, uh, in many different sectors that we need to build infrastructure. Agriculture, agribusiness, for example, in Brazil, uh, we have an opportunity in logistics because it's very expensive to, to bring the, 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 the products to the port. So it's another thing that we focus on. Uh, we have investment in railroads. So infrastructure is an is a, is a, a important part of our private investments. Mm -hmm. uh, our private investments. Uh, oil and gas is interesting. We invest in, in a company uh, to develop drilling ships for Petrobras. Petrobras is developing the pre salt uh, uh, project. So these drilling ships uh, uh, will build 28 uh, drilling ships. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a big, huge project. And it's a very interesting one. Good. You mentioned private equity. Um, is, is the debt markets accommodative to private equity in Brazil these days? Is, are the banks willing to, to finance these deals or? No, you have, yeah. you have. But I think that's, a, the point is the impact of the private equity funds in Brazil uh, is much more than, for example, here, because uh, you have uh, unconsolidated sectors in Brazil, you have uh, 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 lack of governance in some uh, not listed companies. So the private equity fund can aggregate much more than restructure the capital right. of, of the company. And so that's why we, we expect returns above the average of here, but because it is this. And, and we are a country that uh, has a lack of savings. So it's, it's very expensive to finance business in Brazil, continue being. Right. Interest rates reduce, but uh, uh, to give an idea, a long-term bond is, uh, 2050 is paying today inflation plus 4.5 percent per year, so continue to be high <laughs> compared to the. I'll take it. <laughs> Michael, I know you guys, uh, you know, uh, do target uh, Latin America. What are your thoughts in terms of well diversifying more there in the yeah. coming year? We um, we don't have a, a satisfactory exposure today to so-called emerging markets. I like to. I think they're better to call them high growth markets because I think China's probably emerged. Um, but um, and we're, sort of, we're growing that. Today on a direct basis, we have about 8% of our portfolio invested in so-called high growth markets. Uh, indirectly, it's a little higher than that. Uh, and we want to grow that. Um, we have presence today in China, um, in Brazil, uh, a few other countries. But those are China and Brazil are our primary things. Uh, the, you know, I, with respect to emerging markets, just a couple of points. Um, first, to come back to my, one of my favorite words, selectivity. It's probably nowhere more true than in emerging markets, the importance of selectivity. Just buying a market, you know, buying Brazil or Turkey or China by participating in some index, I mean, that is not uh, a good way to try to invest in these, in these countries. So being selective is very important. Um, second thing, uh, it's very important to avoid crowded trades, and there are lots of them, um, in, in so-called high growth markets. So that also requires selectivity and selectivity about the country in which you're going to do, that you're going to do business in. Final thing I'd say, um, we have a rule uh, that we will not invest in a high growth market without 
a substantial local partner. We just won't. And we're, we do that for a simple reason, that it, it, in our minds, you know, the essence of our business, of everyone's business, is information. Mm -hmm. uh, information and understanding. And um, in these markets, you know, the levels of transparency, it's pretty challenging to understand in depth what's going on in these markets. Um, so having a local partner just seems absolutely indispensable to us. I mean, you need that trusted seeing eye that it's very difficult for a Western investor, unless you've been there for 30, 35, 40 years, to have the feel for the market that we would have, for instance, for Canada or the United States or perhaps Europe. Uh, but in China, we don't have that. Right. And in Brazil, we don't have that. But in Brazil, we're fortunate to have a great local partner. Um, so that's that emphasis on local partner. And final point, I guess, on this is all that takes time. And that's one of the challenging things here. Everybody wants to diversify their portfolios and expand in emerging markets. Um, but I think it, to do it well, to do it prudently, takes a lot of time, a lot of presence, a lot of diligence, and a lot of patience. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's completely right. Uh, I mean, you look at uh, emerging markets, and you, I like that term, uh, selective. Uh, but what are the what are the risks that are, are coming with that? And it's it's easy to get the story of a massive increase in consumers with disposable income around the world. You know, another billion, another two billion. And it's a great growth story, but there's no automatic translation of uh, economic growth with growth in equity values. And I guess I think, I hear you say selective, and I just think careful of the entry price, right? And then who your, who your, who your partner is. I certainly want to put uh, CalPERS capital in the path of that growth, but you don't want to forget the United States because US companies are incredibly competitive now uh, and they have global reach. So you, you have to really think about uh, how, to, how, to, how to get there. Uh, Joe, just on your point, yeah. I'll just interrupt you for one second. Somebody yeah. said to me, I love this. Somebody said to me the, the other day, um, opens a whole new issue of discussion, that North <laughs> Dakota is the most interesting emerging market in the world. <laughs> um, yeah. For a whole bunch of reasons having to do with what's going on in energy. But yeah. just to your point yeah. about the United States, and you can find growth and investment opportunities yep. in a lot of places. Right. Right. Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, please. It's a good point. Well, let, let's move back there. It's... it's um, and, and I would agree. I think, you know, as you, as you go into different markets, local knowledge is, is important. I mean, does that for you, Janet, maybe put a limit on how much you would move in emerging markets versus just really good emerging ideas around the U.S.? Well, and let me just build on a few points, which will yeah. capture that. So I agree with this, I mean, this whole selectivity theme. I, I do think you can question that. I mean, everybody's preaching that. We're going to be selective because in a slow growth environment, nobody wants to buy into a 2.5% economy, right? So you have to preach that you are going to be the selective person that's going to find those opportunities within slow growth economy. And I certainly think good managers, you know, many times do outperform, but when you have funds as large as many of us, you sort of wonder, can you find enough opportunities with the right partners to outperform a, a, a slower growth right. environment? And I, I mean, certainly uh, that's what is leading us to say, you know, clearly fixed income is not the answer. Just buying into an equity market isn't going to get us there. Ironically, that's how we've been internationalizing is really the easiest way is through equities. But now we want to try to draw that down a little bit, go into more activist, you know, when you do choose equities. But that put, points us towards the private equity uh, markets or right. alternatives. Um, and there the challenge is this whole building relationships. And that's not only in emerging markets, uh, but it's also in the United States, the alignment, the, the trust factor. Um, so it is uh, not as easy as it sounds to start diversifying your portfolio and find these alternatives. And I think that's going to be the big challenge for all of us, uh, especially particularly large funds that don't have as many folks they can do business with, if you're, especially if you're uh, manpower constrained, which <laughs> North Carolina is. Um, um, all that said, you know, I, I do feel like we've got great partners and many of them here in the room. Uh, that help us find those opportunities, but that's going to be the number one challenge. I bet when you double, if you double your allocation from 20 to 40, the world's going to think you're a lot smarter yeah. uh, and you know, <laughs> even more brilliant than, uh, than, you, than you are already. Right? Funny I mean, and good-looking. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. 
One of the things, if I could, to not forget, just let final comment on high growth markets. One of the things people shouldn't forget, as a Canadian, I, we probably think about this perhaps more than Americans do, I don't know. But there are also indirect ways to participate in the higher growth that's going on in certain, in certain markets. Uh, for instance, we take China. In, in Canada, we have significant investments, as, you'd imagine, as you would imagine, in a lot of Canadian natural resource uh, companies. And the performance of those companies is very substantially influenced by Chinese growth. Now, those are companies that we can understand better because they're right in our backyard. Um, but it's a way, which is why I said our indirect exposure to, say, China is bigger than the, the direct metric that we use to, to measure it from an asset allocation point of view. But what's true of a Canadian natural resource company is also true, for instance, of a, I don't know, Colgate, Palmolive, Nestle's, uh, all these com companies for the same reason are wanting to expand their exposure to the expansion of the middle class and the growth of wealth in, in higher growth markets. But those are also companies that we as Western investors can understand relatively easily. So there's also indirect ways right. of doing it. Let me move uh, maybe the discussion a little bit around the globe again. Yeah, you know, we've, we've been talking about high growth markets, and well, certainly U.S. is not a, is at two percent not high growth. But more important, more dramatically, maybe Europe, uh, in essence, in a recessionary environment. Uh, some may say, just don't touch Europe. You know, certainly uh, you could argue that some of the sovereign yields are being depressed by the, you know, uh, the central bank's support. But there's a lot of companies, and you, and you talk about multinationals. Um, we talk, they have uh, the European uh, high yield market has grown significantly since the crisis. Um, I, I'd like to get your opinions on, is Europe an opportunity? And I know you're starting to look to diversify in, in, in your, Maurizio, and you're in an environment that has high growth. So to go maybe to a market where there might be maybe a little riskier opportunities or maybe a little better value for the risk. Um, is Europe a place you would expand to? Uh, I think return may continue matters in Brazil for us as a Brazilian investor. We need uh, to find, uh, in this process of diversification, we need to find a, a place to where it makes sense for, because we have a local liability in local currency and, and it's very high, continue to be very high compared to, to the rest of the uh, but I think that's this diverse, geographical diversification will make sense, sense for us. Uh, but we will look at uh, asset class that like uh, alternatives outside Brazil or uh, other emerging markets because of return. And that's the way we think. We, we don't have an answer right now, but uh, that's the way right. we have to, 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 to act in the future. Maybe to Joe. So Europe, right, there's solvency, there's liquidity, there's the capacity of the political systems to make very hard choices, and that creates a lot of uh, uncertainty. But, you know, I think one of the dominant factors that we deal with in this en environment is central banks' suppression of interest rates. Uh, that creates a lot of dislocation. Now, I'm not a complaining about this because our private equity portfolio, which got massively overweight uh, in the bubble era, uh, has been saved by low interest rates because the companies have been able to restructure their debt. So um, don't, it's not meant as criticism. Uh, but it does uh, mean that what's happening in markets is distorted. And you have to account for that, both in terms of opportunity so you, you look at the interest rates, and you look at banking regulation, and you look at where capital flows are going, and there's big holes uh, in the market for loans. So there's lots of opportunity, and Europe is one of those places. But you, you gotta be smart about it. Uh, and you, I, I'm much more confident this year than I was a year ago, or in our, in our team is, that, that Europe has shown the ability, uh, not very elegantly, but the ability to step up and get enough of the problem solved uh, that more time is bought and, uh, and that will avoid a catastrophe. And the Europeans have certainly demonstrated a commitment to the idea of, of Europe. But 
is it going to be a high growth region of the world? No, it's not. But is there opportunity in the distress? But there are opportunities, yeah, there are. Yeah, a lot of people are saying there's going to be a, a big distress play. In some ways, there's been opportunities, but maybe not the big opportunity people expect, in part maybe because of the... But so you, uh, you know, so you think you can hammer a bank and get 40% because they've got to restructure their capital to come into compliance with Basel III, uh, but really you can only get 8 to 12. Yeah. Well, if it's, a, if it's safe part of the capital structure, that's okay. That gets us to our 7.5% return. That's not so bad. And if it does it in a way that allows the banking system to... Uh, to function and to keep working, then that's all good. Yeah, we think there are going to be, I mean, you have to have a view that Europe will eventually get out of the situation it's in, and that at this point might require night vision goggles or something, but, but um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we do think that they will, I was at a panel this morning and someone used a phrase that I loved, and it's talking about Euro European political leadership, and they said that they hesitate vigorously um, <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good depiction of what's been going on in terms of political leadership there. Um, but that being said, Europe's Europe, and we don't think Europe's going to go away, and we don't think people are going to move into caves in Europe. So uh, we do think that there are opportunities there. Actually, we have pretty significant, um, pretty significant investments there. But you know, when you think about, I mean, one of the things, just Joe's point, one of the things that the European Central Bank has done uh, with so much so much liquidity having been pushed into the financial system in Europe that frankly, and I think this is one of the reasons why they've done it, it's taken a lot of pressure off European banks in the interest of, of preserving the financial system in Europe and that therefore they have probably not done, at least in our view, the house cleaning of their balance sheets that they are at some point going to have to do. And I think what Mario Draghi's doing is trying to give them an elong period, elongated period of time in order to do it. Well, that's, that has a couple of implications. One they are much more limited in the financing that they're providing to that market, and that opens opportunities, um, particularly in sort of mid-cap, uh, in the mid-cap range. There's opportunities, we think, in infrastructure. Um, so, so that's important. And second, we also think that eventually those balance sheets will get cleaned up. Right. And as they do, for long-term investors such as us, that should open opportunities for us to buy very high-quality assets, and I come back to that theme, at relatively decent prices. But pricing in Europe so far, we haven't really seen that because the European banks have not really felt the pressure given the inundation of, of, of liquidity there. The other thing that's, that, you know, Europe today is a lot about entry price. And if you can get into high quality assets at reasonable prices, either through distress or others, there are opportunities there. So I think it's a mistake to say, you know, Europe, no. If you're careful and patient, there are going to be opportunities there. Well, and clearly, I think there's you can see opportunities just in the premia between, say, high yield markets or the loan markets, and a similar default rate. You have very low default rates in both markets. But let's. Um, well, you remember that line, you know, the the worst loans are made in the best times. That's right. They're like, oh, you know, really low default rate with you know junk bonds. Okay, great. You know, well. Yeah. And two years, what do we have, right? Well, it's, 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 they're always going to be here in some respect. <laughs> Let me um, uh, shift a little bit, um, and I'm going to go back to you know, uh, the alternatives. So we've kind of moved around the world and talked about different relative markets. Uh, but I think alternatives play, uh, obviously, an increasing role, I think, in a lot of institutional managers' portfolios, which, as you said, but it's also one of those words that covers a very broad, you know, base of uh, of opportunities from, you know, real assets to infrastructure, maybe uh, to um, you know, some, uh, uh, hedge funds, etc. When you think about opportunities in real assets, one, you know, how do you define it, and and two, is that part of uh, a strategy to deal with? The effects of potentially inflation as, as a way to hedge the bond portfolio. Right. So opportunities, I think, certainly agree with the direct lending, some of the asset-backed securities, distressed plays, debt lending on real estate, distressed real estate. We have invested in Brazil. I need to brown nose. Uh, so that's the, I will say, of all the bricks, which I've made a point to visit 
all of them, uh, you know, the best opportunities I think we've found just in terms of the pricing and the entry and, and the quality and the legal environment uh, have been more in Latin and South America. So I'm going to a uh, Latin America investment conference uh, next week. So that's kind of part of my uh, deeper dive uh, this year is, is to look there. And um, so those are just a few of the areas, secondary markets and private equity. Um, so yeah. energy. And I do think the whole energy boom has led a lot of people. That's another reason why the diversification globally hasn't happened as much, because there are so many opportunities and excitement around the U.S. energy plays uh, that you just find enough opportunities here with why, why go through all the work and travel. <laughs> just do it here. <laughs> Although North Dakota is still... Difficult to get to from where, for any place. Well, it's, it's, it might be easier some, than some other places. So, um, Maurizia, you know, when, when we talk about all terms, you mentioned, you know, the oil and gas, and, and you know, certainly we talk from EM context, but as you look at finding an opportunity, are there certain places and in international alternatives that? Yeah, I think uh, uh, U.S. for us is an interesting market. I think that's uh, the long term has a good perspective, and of course, it's uh, it's more easier to approve uh, 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 overseas investment with the board with a more uh, no place. That's uh, for uh, because it's, uh, uh, it's a, there's a particularity of the, the the Brazilian investors because they have a fixed income mindset, so equity risk for for Brazilian is very difficult to understand because we used to live in a high interest rate environment, the interest rate paid the bill for everybody, nobody uh, uh, spent time to, to understand the equity risk and diversification of our portfolio, so it's more difficult to understand. Uh, but in our uh, 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 simulations that US buyout makes sense, US uh, private equity makes sense, uh, emerging market makes sense. So, but we don't. We are now trying to understand the micro uh, perspective of each kind of uh, asset class. So we don't have an answer right now. This is the first, uh, the first approach that we had. Uh, but, uh, but I think that's it's important for us uh, from the at this level of interest rate to have a geographical diversification. To have a, uh, it's important right now, and uh, I think it's all the Brazilian pension funds is this, in the same movement. Everybody uh, starts to understand uh, the, the, the limit to invest was increased by the regulator. That was uh, uh, something that the, 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 the pension fund industry uh, asked a lot in, in the past, and so it will be very important for us in the future. I think Mauricio is saying something, a lot of important things there. I mean, if, if you think about the history of Brazil and the fact you can talk about a, a long-term debt market in Brazil uh, and the financing structures are becoming available there, I mean, that would have been impossible just not that long ago. But there have been three government transitions. There's, real, there's a real belief uh, that the Brazilians ha have, you know, got a financial system that's going to work for the long-term. Capital is moving in. Uh, we were talking to we were getting ready for this panel. I mean, CalPERS has, uh, was part of a real estate fund that developed industrial property, and the, and the play is supplying to the consumer market uh, as the middle class rose. Uh, and as typical of funds like that, there, there needed to be a sale of the assets to crystallize the profit for the manager. But those warehouses are sort of centrally located around Sao Paulo and Rio, and we didn't want to sell them. So we spun them out, and we've got them in a long-term hold because we, you know, we want to be there. Uh, for the long term, and that's what's happening with emerging markets. I also went to one of your company uh, iron ore mines out in the you know, out in the jungle, and that's you know yeah. here's this 400 you know 900 foot deep uh, high quality iron ore mine, a 600 kilometer train that's taken the processed ore uh, out to ships, which then go to Europe and China. Uh, I mean, this is amazing, and sure there are ups and downs to the commodity cycle, but this play is going to uh, is going to last, and it makes it an exciting. It makes it a really exciting story and, a, and an opportunity yeah. for us. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to touch on something as, as you were talking about these investments. You, you know, there's often the paradigm that you know, institutional funds will invest through, say, private equity funds. Or, but I also get there's a sense there's, there's more direct investing going, or at least a desire to go more direct 
into whether it's a private equity or large stake position in public equity. Do you see that increasing as a means to one, maybe take more concentrated risk, but one where you can have uh, a more direct impact on the management, for instance? Yeah, we, we factor that we pay about, um, th well, $18 million in fund to fund fees, that if we could just hire some extra staff, no. That's the return. I mean, so hopefully we can, I was talking to Joe about this, <laughs> right. convince our legislators that that is a good return on investment yeah. and not an expansion of government. Um, <laughs> it's a harder sell than you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. There, you know, there's really strong evidence uh, from CEM benchmarking that funds that can internally manage assets have an advantage, and the Canadians are certainly uh, leaders in demonstrating mm -hmm. the utility of, of, of those strategies. The argument you have to make, you know, somebody's going to get paid to manage the investments. Uh, you can have it be a public employee, and as a public employee, they're going to make a lot of money relative to other public employees. Is, is that fair, right, or just? I don't know. That's the labor market. But if it's not a public employee doing it, then it's a private sector, and they're going to get 10 times at least what the, the private sector. And I don't mean that's the automatic reason to do or not do insourcing. But it's a, it's a powerful reason for larger institutional investors, pension funds, to develop that capacity and have that choice. Yeah. I think there are limits to how far you can take it. And we manage uh, almost all our, equ our equity, uh, public equity inter internally, I mean 80%, and then active is the last 20. 92% uh, of our fixed income is internally managed. And you know we're, we're paying a fraction of a basis point for that. I mean, that's, it's incredibly efficient. Uh, but when you move to the private asset classes, um, in private equity, I think you can, can move to a co-investment capacity. And if you negotiate a no-fee, no-carry relationship with the general partner, then you're reducing the, you're, you're improving the economics. Uh, and that seems a reasonable step. But I think for U.S. funds to, to follow the Canadians and to actually field teams of merchant bankers, if you will, really hard to compete in that, in that labor market at, at what we're going to reasonably a, be able to pay. Where CalPERS has had some success is infrastructure, and this ties back to your uh, question earlier, Tom, about, about real assets. Uh, we've been able to, uh, to sort of get in deals with, with others, so we're not taking a majority position. Uh, it, infrastructure assets are, are fiercely competed over because they have such attractiveness to pension funds. Clearly inflation protection, uh, good income stream, and that's, you know, we pay benefits with cash, so income is more and more important. Uh, and the potential of creating structures that allow for long-term holds, assets that you want to keep, uh, keep and hold. But everybody sees that. Uh, and at least in the United States, for all of the interest and understanding, and there have been a lot of talk here at the conference about the need to finance infrastructure, there's not a lot on the market. Uh, I mean, we really have to create more opportunity. I mean, to my view, you know, it's not shortage of capital, which is, which is restraining uh, public pension plan investment in infrastructure. It's the lack of vehicles. Uh, or the lack of tax laws that, uh, that you know, welcome our kind of capital. That's I think this is out. really important. As, as a Canadian, you have to let me steal the opportunity to make a national advertisement <laughs> here. Um, that you know, we do manage internally, uh, overall, I think total of our portfolio, 85% of it, um, 80, 87% of it is managed internally by us. Um, and we do it uh, at an incredibly low cost to the people whose money we manage to quantify that at 17 cents per hundred dollars of assets. Um, so very cheap. Um, and our performance has been pretty good. So it's not like you're sacrificing quality, or at least not yet. Um, so that's one point. But actually, I think that's not the most important point. I think the more important point is when you look at, you know, to come back to this question, where, you, where the returns going to come mm -hmm. from, um, which is not an easy question, and you look at where fixed income is and what that's probably going to be like for the next while and the percentage that fixed income represents of so many institutional investors' portfolios, you've got a big hole-filling challenge here. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of, some of that hole is going to get filled in private equity, in infrastructure, in real estate, you know, in other categories of assets. But a lot of those categories of assets that the best assets, and I'm going to come back to infrastructure in a second, the best assets are assets that are going to be, we believe, made more available to long-term institutional investors than they are to a private equity fund 
that an investor then invests in. And I say that because private equity funds, and no criticism here, they're, we use them and, and they're very good at what they do, but they do have a business imperative mm -hmm. to turn over the portfolio, to do things. I mean, we're all familiar with that. Well, I come to my infrastructure point. If, if I'm a government and I'm thinking about privatizing a gas distribution system or a water system or, a, or an absolutely mission critical airport, am I gonna, do I wanna do that with someone who's gonna have to do something with that every four or five years? Or do I wanna do that with a collection of large institutional long-term holders who are gonna be stable and good proprietors of this nationally important asset? Well, I think I know the answer to that. Um, and therefore, I must say, I, again, my heart goes out to my American colleagues here, in that, in that it's much harder uh, to, to get the prize assets that you want to have in your portfolio for 10 or 15 years um, if you're doing it indirectly. And therefore, internal management and your, avail availabil your ability to do those deals becomes really important, I think, to stepping up to the challenge of where will the returns come from in a world where fixed income is going to generate, what, two, three, maybe, maybe 4%. Right. Big hole to fill. And in order to do it, I think being able to participate in those kinds of deals, very important. Yeah. I think, that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that's a subject we could uh, follow on for a while. But we're, we're drawing to near the end of our uh, session, so I just wanted to do one quick go around. And we're sitting in 2013. The next 12 months, you know, what's your best idea? Or what would well, you like? I, I have two things I want to say. I, I love living in California, but right now I wish I lived in North Carolina so I could vote for <laughs> Janet. Because, you know, to have a public official, uh, an elected official, talk knowledgeably about investment yes. is really something special here, here. and so fiduciary. So hats off to, hats yes. off to you and the challenge you, you have. Uh, Tom, I'm mildly optimistic. I think it is a slow growth environment, but it's not a no growth environment. Uh, I think we're coming through the period of pessimism, which was spawned by the trauma of the global financial crisis. Uh, I think there's more willingness to put capital to work. Now it's not one uninterrupted uh, slow uh, slope curve moving up. But uh, you look at housing uh, in the United States, that's coming back. Household formation will drive a lot of growth and, and a lot of employment. Uh, we can criticize Washington, D.C., easy to do, uh, but there are those steps forward which are happening, that incremental, not very pretty uh, process. I think there's some reason to have some optimism about the political system responding. And I think if you go around this conference and you see the ideas that are happening in medicine and science and education and finance, uh, and you look around the world at the hunger of the Chinese or the Brazilians, uh, to, to grow their economies, uh, it makes me think that we're, we're coming to a better we're coming to a better period. Uh, not easy. Uh, seven and a half will be a challenge uh, for us, or six and seven. Wow, I'd love that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, carefully thought through strategies, a long-term perspective, and a and a and a thoughtful search for dislocation and a nimbleness to move and take advantage of that. Uh, should serve a, a, a plan like CalPERS as well. Yeah, North Carolina, I would just say we're going to try to get as much flexibility as we can to take advantage of all these opportunities and uh, try to find the best partners for those. I think, again, it'll probably be in the credit space, uh, a lot of opportunities there, more active, selective equ equity, uh, debt real estate, um, stressed real estate. Right. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, opportunities across a lot of different asset classes, uh, and I appreciate the part to be, uh, appreciate your words, but <laughs> appreciate uh, being able to be part of this panel and come to Milken every year because I do find it inspiring as well. It, it does give you uh, some hope and inspiration. Absolutely, absolutely. Michael, final thoughts? Um, well, I'd say we are cautiously optimistic. Um, we don't think that this is a time to sit on the sidelines. This is a time to have a, you know, a moderately offensive posture, but moderately, cautiously, uh, but not sit on the sidelines. The, and we are doing that uh, in terms of deploying capital. The one thing I would say, I just want to come back to something in wrapping up that, that, that Joe said at the outset. Um, you know, I think we're living at a time of highly, highly politicized markets. And I, in, 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 this, in the sense of 
politicized in that so much of what's happening in the markets today is a function of monetary policy. Um, so much of it is a function of political issues, particularly in Europe. I think political issues in the United States are less important, but in Europe they're very important. Um, and that represents, um, if there's one thing that keeps us awake at night, is there's a lot of exogenous political risk yeah. um, in the investing environment today. Because I think monetary policy is a quasi-political risk. It's not a purely technical issue anymore, for sure. Um, and that adjustments on that front are things that could change the landscape. Now, it could change it positively, it could change it negatively. And therefore, it does require, I think, a very high degree of vigilance and an understanding of what's going on in terms of monetary authorities and the people who control fiscal policy and the future of the European Union. Those, those things have to be on everybody's radar screen because they can change the either up or down and therefore will require adjustment. But overall, cautiously optimistic. Real quick, Mauricio. Well, uh, as I see, I have a pension fund. I, 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 I don't like to think in the next 12 months <laughs> because we don't have an answer. Uh, but uh, of course, we will continue doing the, the same what, what we have been done in the, in the last 10 years. Uh, continue to diversify the portfolio locally. That's a, that's a need, increasing equity position, uh, real estate position, uh, private equity position, uh, look at international markets to, to find uh, something that makes sense for us. That's, uh, and continue looking at the long-term trends and find opportunities there. Great. Well, thank you to the panel, and thanks to all of you. Have a good night.